Hatsi, can you hear us? Are you there? I can hear you, and now I'm unmuted, so hopefully you can hear me. Yes, perfectly. Okay. So, thank you everyone for coming back. I hope you had a nice break and some fresh air after the morning discussion. So, we are going to restart with a small change because it was supposed in the agenda to start with our first uh, honorary mention uh, award in, um, by the Start Prize project in the 2022 Avatar Robo Cafe, but uh, Maria, who has some uh, issues in connecting, so we are restarting with the second artist foreseen in the agenda. Um, we are talking about in event of moon disaster, which has been uh, awarded by the prize in 2021. And we have connected remotely Halsey Burgund. Halsey is a new media artist and Emmy winning interactive director was work focused on the combination of modern technologies. So from mobile phones to artificial intelligence with fundamentally human technologies, primarily language, music, and the spoke voice. Alsi's recent work has focused on the societal challenges posed by artificial intelligence, in particular, synthetic, synthetic media and generative AI. Um, Alsi today will uh, report about an event of Moon Disaster, so this uh, project uh, focused on the topic of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, first, to give him the floor, we will see the video um, about the installation and then he will talk more about where the idea comes from, how the they, he and his co-artists co uh, decided to work around the topic of disinformation and also providing some information about how the installation and the production has been organized from a technical and technological perspective. Um, it's relevant, this, this is a project that we appreciate a lot um, because it really gives us uh, the, the flavor of how relevant art and in, in this kind of installation uh, can be relevant to inform people to change the way in which we address some topics, critically thinking and reflecting on some uh, issue. So uh, then I will also ask Alce to, to conclude a bit his intervention, also letting us understand how they selected, why they selected the topic of disinformation and what they expect he and his, he and his colleagues as artists in terms of support from policy uh, due to the fact that disinformation is also a very relevant topic for policy issues. So before uh, I said, before to start, let's see the video and then we talk to Alsi. Armstrong and Aldrin are scheduled to set foot on the moon. That's kind of like a, a pitch change rather than an acceleration increase. This is CBS News color coverage of Man on the Moon. Sponsored by... Kellogg. Kellogg's puts more in your morning. Here from CBS News Apollo headquarters at Kennedy Space Center, correspondent Walter Cronkite. Good morning. It's T minus one hour, 29 minutes, and 53 seconds and counting in just an hour and a half. If all goes well, Apollo 11 astronauts Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins are to lift off from pad 39A out there on the voyage man always has dreamed about. Next stop for them, the moon. So it is now that there is time, uh, if only briefly in this busy morning, to think of those three men and the burdens and the hopes that they carry on behalf of all mankind. Here's Jack King and Launch Control. We're approaching the 60-second mark on the Apollo 11 mission. 
T-minus, 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, it looks good, Wally. Somebody must be leaving the arm. Building shaking. We're getting that buffeting we've become used to. What a moment. Man on the way to the moon. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. These brave men, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin, know that there is no hope for their recovery. But they also know that there is hope for mankind in their sacrifice. These two men are laying down their lives in mankind's most noble goal, the search for truth and understanding. They will be mourned by their families and friends. They will be mourned by their nation. They will be mourned by the people of the world. They will be mourned by a mother earth that dared send two of her sons into the unknown. In their exploration, they stirred the people of the world to feel as one. In their sacrifice, they bind more tightly the brotherhood of man. In ancient days, men looked at stars and saw their heroes in the constellations. In modern times, we do much the same, but our heroes are epic men of flesh and blood. Others will follow and surely find their way home. Man's search will not be denied. But these men were the first, and they will remain the foremost in our hearts. For every human being who looks up at the moon in the nights to come will know that there is some corner of another world that is forever mankind. 
Good night. So thank you, um, thank you, Alsi, for uh, for sending the video. The video is also going uh, outside this room on another screen uh, all day long. So if you want to look at it uh, again, it's always there on streaming and as well with uh, with the other project Avatar Robo Cafe. So Alsi, uh, coming back to you, can you are you connected? Are you there? Great. I I I am speaking. I uh, can okay. you guys hear me? Perfect. I I am, I'm actually coming to you from uh, outside of Boston in the U.S. Not not the moon, but um, I am uh, sometimes wish I could uh, travel up to the moon. It seems like a not not a bad place to be. But let me uh, let my share let me share my screen here and um, go through a few slides. Yes, please. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Is that something we can enable? While we're waiting for that, I just want to thank uh, thank everybody for having me here. It's really a, an honor and a, a pleasure to share uh, this project with you guys. Uh, being associated with Starts and being honored by Starts has been amazing for the project and for for us individually. And um, it's just a wonderful uh, opportunity to uh, speak. I will say this is a different audience than uh, than quite often I speak with, but I'm, I'm eager to uh, to share and uh, and hear from you guys in the Q and A as well. Should I try to share screen again? Give me a sec. We it's are trying to understand. Still saying host disabled. Can you can you launch the presentation, Alsi? Yeah, um, it, it, I am trying to share my screen, yeah. and it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, wait a sec. Yeah, sure, no problem. All right, it looks like we are doing better now. Can you can you repeat uh, can you try again to share the screen? Yes. Yes, goes perfect. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> All right. You know, what would a presentation be without a few technical challenges? That is that is uh, okay. All right. Well, thank you again for having me here. Um, I'm just going to go through a few slides uh, after having watched um, the video, so you have it fresh in your mind. Um, first, I just want to say that uh, my co-director, Fran Panetta, unable to uh, join us today, but um, just want to give her a, a bit of a shout out. Uh, this is a, a team sport here, and I am just representing uh, Fran, myself, and a bunch of others who were uh, instrumental in bringing this project to life. So um, the inspiration for this project is actually a, a combination of two things. One, 
very old thing, about 50 years old, which is a, uh, a real speech that came from the archives, a contingency speech that came from the U.S. National Archives, which is what you just heard President Nixon deliver. Um, and uh, in addition to one old thing, one very new thing, which is deep fake technology. We could call it generative AI nowadays. You could call it synthetic media. These are different names for um, you know, uh, AI enhanced um, and manipulated uh, video audio content. So, um, as I said, the old the old was this contingency speech written by Bill Sapphire for President Nixon. Um, this was never delivered in real life uh, because the Apollo 11 mission actually was successful. Hopefully, we all are aware of that and weren't fooled by what we just saw. Um, but. Uh, we thought that if we were able to take this real speech, something that actually existed and could have been delivered in real life, um, and bring it to life, uh, make it, you know, essentially create a uh, version of President Nixon delivering it, that we could use that as a bridge into an alternative universe that would allow us to create a sort of compelling aesthetic experience, as well as an educational awareness campaign about the dangers of this new technology. Um, as you heard in the intro, this project is largely about um, misinformation, disinformation, and um, new technologies. And uh, we thought this combination of the old and the new would be a good way to um, shed some light on that from an aesthetic perspective. So why, why the moon? Um, Obviously, the contingency speech led us in that direction. When we were building the project, it was the 50-year anniversary of the Apollo 11 um, moon landing, which is why we were thinking about it. But we also just know that people love the moon. The moon captures our imaginations. It was, um, you know, the Apollo 11 mission was one of the first truly global media events, which now comes thick and fast because we have such a new uh, media, ecos media ecosystem. Um, we also thought that uh, the moon... You know, it was 50 years ago, so it's not a present day thing. We're not going to get into any huge political uh, issues because um, this topic was not um, not incredibly political as a lot of things are nowadays. And we didn't want we didn't want our message to be overshadowed by, um, you know, political uh, partisan issues. Um, and also, um, you know, at the time, 50 years ago, this moon landing was really the major technical achievement of humanity. And. We are in a new era right now where I would argue that one of, if not the most major technical achievement of humanity right now, which is huge and might have implications, you know, bigger than the moon uh, moon landing is, is AI, artificial intelligence and all its different forms, um, which I'm not going to get all into now, but it's a moment for us all that that's very exciting and scary at the same time. So as stated, this project is, you know, about disinformation and about the use of generative AI in producing uh, disinformation. So we we strive as artists for our work to make an impact beyond just the aesthetic experience. Obviously, we that's a wonderful thing. But if we can um, have our work, uh, you know, focus on pro-social uh, impact as well, then we're we're very happy about that. And I think, as we all know, disinformation is one of the most pressing issues of today. So we were hoping that. Uh, as artists, we could use our skills, which are different than, you know, policymaker skills, policy, uh, you know, politician skills, um, uh, you know, technical folks skills. Uh, but if we could use our artistic skills to um, create an impactful experience that would help spread the word about how these new technologies can be used to create disinformation camp and and create the disinformation and then social media networks, et cetera, can be used to share that in disinformation, then we will hopefully have a positive impact on the world. So, you know, we feel that if we can convince people even for a moment that the moon landing didn't happen the way that they have always known it to have happened, then we can we can perhaps convince them to look at their Facebook feeds with a little bit more uh, skepticism and uh, and look a little more for evidence um, to support uh, the media that they're that they're seeing on a daily basis that we all see, the deluge that we all see every day. So, we wanted to, you know, not focus only on the negative. Um, these new technologies are are pretty amazing and can do some amazing, uh, can create amazing experiences and can do a lot of positive things in the world. Um, but obviously, we want to uh, focus on on the warning, um, you know, the warning that uh, that these technologies amp up all the uh, all the potential for disinformation out there. 
So I wanted to share just a quick photo um, of, of the installation version of the project, um, just to sort of share with you guys that this, this project is not just the video that you saw, but the sort of the full, the full version is, um, is a, uh, a physical installation of a, of a living room that you see here. This is one that was done at the Museum of the Moving Image in New York City. And the film plays on an old television. And the idea is that you're physically immersed. You walk back in time, if you will, as you step into this space. And, you know, as though you are, you know, attending uh, a, um, you know, a party to watch the moon landing, uh, you sit down and watch this, um, this alternative history unfold in front of you. So um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a peek into how we created this deep fake that you just saw of President Nixon. Um, and there's a couple of short videos that are gonna show different stages of this. And uh, hopefully the, the audio will come through. Somebody, uh, somebody could yell out if the audio doesn't happen. But um, this first clip is the what we call the target clip. Um, we wanted to make a deep fake that was as authentic as possible. So we wanted to start with a video of President Nixon saying something else and then basically change what he's saying into these new words that you heard earlier. Um, the speech that we chose for this was actually a section of his resignation speech. It had the right somber um, sort of reserved tone and um, I will try to play a quick section of that just so you can see that everything in this video is the same as what you just saw, except obviously he's saying different things. In all the decisions I have made in my public life, I have always tried to do what was best for the nation. Throughout the long and difficult period of Watergate, I have felt it was my duty to persevere make every possible effort to complete the term of office. So that was the, again, the target video, the one that we were manipulating. And then we had to know how to manipulate it. So the way that that was done at the time, I will caveat this by saying that some of these techniques have changed uh, quite a bit in the, uh, the sort of four years since we made this, but um, I think uh, a lot of it is similar enough that, that, that it's still useful and, and, and interesting, hopefully. So we had to, um, have uh, in order to know how the lips were supposed to move to deliver the different words of the speech, we had an actor deliver the speech the way we wanted it delivered, you know, slow, somber as a president. And um, and then those lip move motions were mapped onto um, President Nixon's lips in the video you just saw. So here's the actor. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. So, as I said, the actor's lips were uh, analyzed by the AI, as was the target video, and then the AI sort of put those two things together um, along with, initially, with the actor's voice. So you will, you will uh, see this is slightly different than what you saw earlier, but um, we're getting closer. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. So clearly that was not too convincing because it did not sound at all like President Nixon. That was uh, the actor's unmanipulated voice. Um, we also had to create synthetic a synthetic Nixon voice because um, we wanted this to be a complete deep fake, which we the term we use for uh, both audio and video being manipulated. So in order to do that, we work with a company called Respeecher, um, a Ukrainian company, um, to convert the actor's voice into Nixon's voice. And long story short, the way that was done at the time was to record a lot of clips of the actor saying things that um, basically try to replicate uh, the cadence and style of clips of Nixon. And then all those uh, all those audio clips, pairs of audio clips, the actor and Nixon together would get ingested by this AI and it would learn how to reproduce anything the actor said in um, a Nixon, uh, a synthetic Nixon voice. So here's a quick clip as to the training process um, that we did for the AI. And do what 
I believe is right. And do what I believe is right. Is right? And do what I believe is right. And do what I believe is right. Was right. Was. I think. And do what I believe is right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do what I believe is right. And do what I believe was right. So as you can see, that was a uh, a painstaking experience. It had to uh, that had to happen about a, a, you know a thousand times. Um, again, it's a little easier now, but that was the, the the process at that time. And I will just play very quickly. You guys have obviously seen all of this, but this is bringing the synthetic voice in with the manipulated target video with the lips manipulated, and the final result is. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of how uh, how we sort of created this. Um, this is, uh, again, there are there are numerous ways of going about this. This is the method we chose, and um, we felt it was it was pretty convincing, especially at the time when we were doing this. Um, the pace of development of AI technologies is is blistering nowadays, and um, new things, new new approaches are coming out all the time, but uh, it's impossible to keep up with as as much as I try. Um, so I did want to just sort of reiterate the point that um, these technologies are sort of, you know, agnostic in and of themselves. They don't, they're not made for only evil things, but of course, there's a lot of possibility for them being used for disinformation, but there's also amazing opportunities for creativity. There's medical uses. There's all sorts of positive um, uses of these technologies um, as well that I don't want to lose sight of. Another point that I also want to not lose sight of is that um, media manipulation is nothing do. Um, you know, as, as, as long as media has existed, there have been, uh, you know, the ability to manipulate, uh, whether it be, you know, texts or photos or audio or anything like that. Um, you know, prior to AI, there were, you know, what we now call cheap fakes, which are things like reversing video and slowing things down and speeding things up and um, taking, you know, the simple act of putting an incorrect caption on a picture is, you know, all very, very straightforward, easy methods for um, creating disinformation. And um, this, you know, all of this new AI stuff that I've been demonstrating and talking about and which we used in the film is really just an extension of this continuum of, um, of uh, you know, manipulations and disinformation uh, potential that has been out there um, for a while that we all need to, you know, continue to be aware of. You know, thankfully, a lot of these previous um, approaches uh, we're, you know, society has gotten used to a lot of them. We're pretty used to Photoshop nowadays. So hopefully as we go, um, we'll, we'll get more and more used to some of these newer um, approaches and we will, uh, you know, minimize the chances of being manipulated by them. So art and policy. Um, as Simona said, I did want to get a little bit into into this. Um, I clearly am not a policymaker of any sort. I'm eager to learn, eager to uh, you know, uh, you know, be a part of this discussion. I am, of course, affected by policy as we all are. It's uh, extremely important, and um, you know, to me, there are sort of two parts to this, you know, art and policy uh, question here. One is policy about art, like. That's a wonderful thing. Policies that uh, that that allocate funding for the arts and 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 the preservation and development of culture and all of that, which is wonderful, and I applaud all of those efforts. Um, however, the thing that I want to talk about here is more um, art being able to influence policy, perhaps. Um, and you know, part of Event of Moon Disaster, although it wasn't designed specifically to influence policy, it was certainly designed as an awareness campaign that. You know, one of the target groups being policymakers to um, help help uh, help you folks understand more about uh, you know in a different way perhaps than uh, you know technical explanations understand uh, what you know what some of these challenges are and what these new technologies uh, might bring to uh, society. So, just going to go through a few um, bullet points that I sort of pulled together here um, and then jump to an example of how our project has been used um, in a sort of policy setting um, or has influenced policy, I should say. So um, art isn't just functional, I think, uh, sorry, is, 
sorry, this is not supposed to say art isn't just functional. Art isn't just not functional. Um, art can be very functional and it can perform, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it can be useful, not just, not just an experience, an aesthetic experience. Um, I think I've shown that throughout this presentation, hopefully. Um, policymakers are people, sorry, bad joke, but, um, you know, all people can be impacted through their hearts as well as their brains and, um, you know, getting, uh, you know, getting a point reiterated to you through the lens of an artistic experience, in my mind, is um, a wonderful sort of reinforcement of the same point perhaps being made from a scientific perspective or a technical perspective or a policy perspective, perhaps. So I feel, you know, my skills are as an artist and um, I, that's the only, the only way I know how to, how to, how to sort of create and, and enter these discussions. So um, I feel that it's, uh, that it's a useful approach to take just for diversity, if nothing else. Um, you know, exposure through example, um, you know, saying there is disinformation out there and saying you need to worry about X, Y, and Z because you might believe something that isn't true is one thing, but actually seeing something that makes you feel that something you know isn't true could be believable is perhaps a more impactful and durable way of um, getting the point. Um, so complex issues benefit from multifaceted approaches. You know, artists tend to have different you know ways of thinking about the world um, than uh, than other folks do, and um, obviously there's no no set way that any any particular group of people you know view the world, but a diversity of experience and um, you know, as I say here, multifaceted approaches really uh, helps with complex issues such as the one we're talking about now with disinformation. Um, and that really encapsulates the last point as well. Artists can bring a diversity approach, opinion, and experience to the policy debate. So I'm a big fan of um, artists being involved in this stuff, whether it be um, us in this project or any of the innumerable objects that um, that uh, I think can help uh, help guide policy in certain ways. Um, so to that end, I wanted to give one example and then wrap up. Uh, the example that I wanted to share here is um, a way in which I feel our project, this moon disaster project, did affect policy in, uh, in Denmark. Um, uh, we were approached after the project uh, went live by the uh, Danish Film Institute. Um, and uh, they were very interested in um, media literacy for their uh, their school kids. Um, and they thought that this project would be a, you know, upon seeing this project, they realized that it, as an artistic entree into this topic, would be a great way to um, connect with uh, the, the youth in Denmark. Um, so they contacted us to see if we could build the website in, uh, in a translated version of the website in, in Danish. And um, and then they built um, a number of educational resources that school teachers would be able to use throughout their um, their uh, you know sort of nationalized school system to uh, talk about these issues, to talk about media literacy, to talk about can you believe everything you see, you know what's true, what isn't, how are how are the powers that be using media to manipulate um, your thoughts to their benefit, et cetera, et cetera, and um, and they they developed a whole uh, line of um, uh, of materials to uh, to support this. So, you know, in my mind, this is a this is a way that this project, um, you know, affected the the policymakers to the extent that they were able to allocate funding to um, to make this happen. And uh, you know, time will tell how useful this is, but it is it is in place now. And um, I hope that uh, you know the Danish children are uh, are uh, you know um, you know more aware than they would otherwise be, perhaps, of these issues. So I'll just wrap it up with, you know, a question, what other ways can artists and policymakers work together towards pro-social goals? Uh, you know, I don't know all the ways by any stretch. I'm just providing an example. I think, you know, artists move fast. We do a lot of experimenting and are not burdened with the machinations of policymaking, which makes our job easy in some ways. We can just sort of do these crazy things. But, um, you know, if we can interface with folks who uh, who have the, have the power to influence society um, as policymakers do, then you know perhaps some of our crazy experiments can be tempered and brought into uh, a place where they are more directly useful in a in a pro-social way. So I will end on that note and thank you all again for having me. And uh, I think we're moving on to Q and A or something else. But I will turn it back to uh, Simona. Thank you.
Thank you, Alsi. Um, yes, I think this really show perfectly how things are connected. So the social pressure on a topic like uh, disinformation and also how uh, we need mm, also to understand somehow to understand technology and how the challenges that are posed to technology like deep fake. Uh, it's better understood when you are exposed to a different way to reflect on the topic. So we are working also on this information and we know, mm, we, we discuss with researchers, we talk to the people, uh, we all know the urgency, but somehow this kind of work installation can really change your mindset because it's, it forces you to think about how urgent it is, the, the problem. So this is why we think that in Event of Moon Disaster is one of uh, the examples to, to reflect on how different components uh, can be put together to make the difference and an impact on, in this case, on, on the people and on the awareness of people on certain topics. Um, so I would really ask if you have any question for us here in the, in the room. So the question here is how long it takes to create all the all the work, the installation, and um, yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you, Simona, for uh, uh, repeating that because I, I, I didn't hear any of what was said by the, the questioner. But um, yeah, as far as how long um, the technical parts, I mean, we worked on we worked on the project itself for you know six to eight months um and uh obviously it was not full time throughout the website was a big part of the uh of the of the of the project as well well to sort of get the word out the film itself and the deep fake itself we were working on for probably four months um i will say that timelines have shifted from a technical perspective obviously from an artistic perspective there's still a lot of you know just you know, we as artists, creative people need to think through things and try things. And, and you know, the whole film is much more than just the deep fake. It's all the sort of lead up to it and how to how to bring people through this 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 experience in the most um, impactful way is something that I don't think you can ever speed those things up. Um, but from a technical perspective, uh, deep fakes can be created much, much, much quicker now. Um, you know, at the time we had Whenever we wanted a new version, it would take you know several days of computer crunching through um, you know the AI model crunching through uh, lots of material to create new versions for us. Now those things can happen you know you know within minutes instead of within days, and that is uh, you know that's part of the part of the challenge here is that these things are getting more and more uh, easy to do. I'm, I'm working on a new project with with Fran as well that. Um, will essentially be able to create these sort of manipulations almost in real time and sort of show how people, individuals can, you know, it's not just presidents of the United States that might be manipulated by this, but it's it's all of us who might have um, have this, uh, this sort of thing done to them and uh, the ensuing reputational, financial, et cetera, um, damages are, are, are not insignificant. So hopefully that uh, answers the question. Thank you. Yes, this is so. Any other question? Yes, there is one over there. <laughs> Hi, um, great video. Thanks. <laughs> what was like the most challenging part when you were creating the deep fakes? Um, did, was there something that you had to work on, like extra, extra hard on, like some things of the face, for example, didn't match, or maybe the posture, or? like technical question kind of from my end. Yeah, sure. Gosh, there were lots of lots of hard parts here and there. Um, you know, one of the really hardest parts, this actually isn't overly technical. I'll talk about some technical ones as well, but was if you recall the 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 the, the video that was manipulated, you know, we only changed the mouse. So there are a whole bunch of other things that Nixon was doing. You know, he's moving his head, he's moving his hands and he's you know, he's he's you know speaking like a, like people do, and we have lots of motions associated with that. So 
finding a section where he made gesticulations and made head motions and whatnot that vaguely lined up with the progress of this different speech, the different set of words, was um, very, very time consuming. You know, we would go through and, you know, you line up one thing perfectly and then the next thing would be off by a little. So it was this sort of back and forth of aligning and realigning this uh, original video content and all the gesticulations of that to try to match up with this new, um, totally different content um, uh, audio speech that was being delivered. So that was that was a, a big challenge. Um, from a technical perspective, the voice was actually more difficult than the um, visuals. Uh, the visuals, we did have to do some very small manipulations at the end to sort of, again, realign things to make the lips look really um, really uh you know synced up it's funny i was i can't tell you how many hours i did spend sort of looking at president nixon's lips that's a weird thing to say but that was that was uh, uh many many hours um but the voice itself was um was a challenge the voice model produced um uh geez like 30 or 40 different versions of the speech and each phrase, some versions were better than other phrases, so we did have to do a bunch of post-production on that too to pull together um, the best takes, the most accurate takes of each one. And we had to run the model a few times in order to get rid of some of the artifacting, some of the weird popping sounds and very um, distorted sounds that would come through. So that was, you know, it was a lot of iteration and a lot of, um, you know, trial and error. Um, we worked, as I mentioned, with uh, Respeacher and the visual company we worked with was called Canny AI um, from uh, Israel. And uh, they were both amazing and, um, you know, helped us throughout. But uh, yeah, lots of very fine looking and fine, uh, fine tuning of things. So it wasn't just like press a button and boom, it's done. Getting closer to that now, though, I will say. Thank you, Alti. Thank you very much. I think we can uh, close, uh, close the connection with you, but uh, we are happy to have you for the rest of the day. Now the next session uh, is about, uh, as we said at the beginning, um, the slot dedicated to all of you. So we have Stella who will manage the discussion. Wherever you, of you want to speak about your project, uh, flesh up some issues that are connected to the to the discussion. We are very happy to to listen your voice and and follow up for the next session. Great, thank you, Simona. Um, so, as Simona said, this is a session uh, we have plans that are specific to uh, other regional centers and projects. And uh, basically, what we would like is to hear. Um, uh, experiences, issues, topics, opportunities, but also lessons learned that uh, you have and you think are, are important to bring up today to share with the community of art, science, and technology uh, for its benefit and uh, growth. And our aim is to basically collect food for thought for uh, the discussion that will uh, follow at the end and for the future of the ecosystem. So um, I already have a list of names, but then we, if we have some time, um, other people could also uh, speak and uh, share their opportunities. And we'll start with uh, Sotiris uh, Viplaris from the Resilience Project. And, um, Hello, uh, I am Soteris Diplaris uh, from uh, CERT, uh, the Center for Research and Technology, Hellas in Greece. Uh, we are coordinating the, um, uh, the Horizon Europe uh, Resilience Project. It's a, a project for uh, artistic experimentation. Um, in CERT, we have experience also in coordinating uh, previous uh, Starts Lighthouses uh, project, like the Mind Spaces project, but uh, uh, at this moment, we are only already one year in uh, the resilience project. Uh, at this uh, stage, well, methodologically, first I would like to say that we are following more or less the same paradigm we have discussed this morning until the next, uh, the following sessions uh, about uh, tailoring the work around uh, challenges. So we have this vision uh, in uh, uh, that, uh, of course, has to do with the 
uh, urban uh, acoustic awareness uh, uh, in general. So we articulate that in four different challenges. Uh, these different uh, challenges then uh, uh, are given as a food for thought to the artists uh, where we have uh, uh, open calls and um, actually we are at this moment at the stage where we have already selected 15 artists that will work with the consortium in the next two years in order to deliver the uh, outcomes. Uh, so at the moment, uh, one uh, I think lesson learned <laughs> was that um, actually in order to be able to uh, um, have um, efficient uh, uh, collaboration between the artists and the scientists and the technology offers uh, in the consortium, uh, we really had to go to have a strict evaluation uh, stage in the open calls. So actually we also had 130 applications in our first open call in May. We only selected five artists also out of this call. Uh, and um, there was a subsequent second open call uh, in, uh, during the summer where we had another 130 applications, more or less from the same artists though, that they have improved their initial application and have made it more relevant to the scope of our project. Uh, we believe in this way we have managed somehow to get more relevant uh, applications. And um, now that we have selected another 10 artists, well, they're not only artists, they're artists or uh, groups of artists or artists and SMEs, so that's the concept. Uh, I think now we are <laughs> at, a, at a stage where we can start the discussion with them uh, about, you know, um, what was called before the elephant in the room. Uh, so the AI and the extended reality technologies that the technology side of the uh, consortium uh, offers. Uh, we want to, our next uh, steps are to build trust the first with the, the artists in uh, using uh, these technologies in making them useful tools for their work uh, in order to deliver uh, results that are relevant and I mean build up to answer into the challenges that have we, see we have initially uh, posed. Uh, we have uh, four uh, let's say regional hubs uh, where they will work in, in uh, Maastricht, in Genoa, in Thessaloniki, Greece and in uh, Munich. And um, uh, we expect uh, from these kind of uh, collaborations, uh, local collaborations, to have uh, um, to emerge, let's say, the citizen engagement um, and um, the society part <laughs> of the stats. Uh, and uh, of course, we want to go wider then, and uh, we believe that the final uh, artworks and outcomes will be available for uh, uh, exhibition and uh, roundtable discussions, and I mean, nurturing uh, more the what is actually uh, useful for the society uh, in uh, big events to be hosted in uh, Sonar Plus D Festival in Barcelona. And um, uh, of course, uh, every year we have presence in Ars Electronica. Uh, and hopefully to this new uh, festival that uh, is to be organized by the European Commission in the next year, I think it was recently uh, announced. Um, so more or less this is our experience, uh, lessons learned. And of course, we're looking forward to uh, future involvement and how STARS will evolve in the next uh, European calls, how uh, the STARS will be embedded in new uh, technology uh, trends like extended reality, AI. I, I think that um, art-based thinking has to offer a lot there, and we expect uh, uh, new calls also to, to embrace uh, artists. So that's all from our side at the moment. Thank you, Sotiris. Um, so we'll move with the next speaker. So we have an opportunity to listen to everybody. And then uh, if we have time, we'll go on with uh, questions. So the next speaker is uh, Valeria Bruschi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here presenting and representing the research uh, center, um, IQ. Um, um, we are part of management um, department of Kaposki University of Venice, and uh, ICO stands for Arts, Industry, and Culture, and um, which, which are the main topics and field we operate in, in and with and for too. And um, we work believing in the in on the uh, transformative power of art as driver for uh, social innovations and local economical. Um, development development issues and um, so creativity forms of hybridizations uh, between different disciplines and social impact are 
at the heart of our uh, works and mm, projects. And in partnership with uh, Cafoscari, uh, with the university, we aim to transfer the um, research results of the university into society by activating and um, by, by activating the creativity of artists and um, cultural cultural professionals professionals um, aiming to simulate cultural change and innovation. Uh, we do that by organizing thematic workshops, providing grants for art science collaborations and art science based resi residencies and um, also promoting cross-disciplinary interventions and activities and uh, program learning. Uh, for example, at the intersection between theater, performing arts and corporate, uh, corporate world. Um, moving on the re uh, regional and local field, in AICU we um, place a significant uh, emphasis on exploring the possibilities and the potential of the interplay between art and science. But we do that uh, recognizing um, that in this particular connection, um, th that mm, this, connection I this connection is primarily channeled through the role of uh, business films. Uh, we, uh, from our perspective, business firms are among the foremost beneficiaries and users of scientific developments. And consequently, uh, we believe that um, a deeper and more social, socially impactful um, um, exploration of this uh, connection be between art and science uh, requires um, a more immersive experience into the corporate uh, items than into the corporate worlds. Um, within this context, for for our perspective, uh, this rela this relationship between arts and science unfolds enrichingly because businesses, films serve and behave as the environment where scientific innovations are fused with arti uh, artistic uh, creativity, giving birth to new technologies, and at the same time, um, the scientific discoveries within the corporate world are transformed into, might be transformed into uh, innovative products and solutions and services to that might um, overcome the conventional boundaries. Uh, ICU Research Center seeks to investigate that topics, um, actively participate in it, in, in shaping it, and towards a more inclusive um, engagement with society. And um, our approach, and this kind of approach in general, of situation, situating the um, examination of the art science interaction within the corporate field allows us to look uh, closely at the implications and practical application of these intersections. Um, in particular, um, the aesthetic and imaginative elements of art uh, merged and mixed uh, with the precision of science to face social challenges and changes and also um, economic growth issues and technological progress. And um, that's it. Mm. And as concerned, that at the moment, we, we're glad to see that we, um, we are receiving high interest from both artistic and business field, um, and business field in the time of intervention we're proposing. And that's it for the moment. If there are any questions, please go. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have Francesco Scarel. Hi, everybody. Uh, oops. First, it's very a pleasure to be here in a kind of a very uh, friendship environment and. Um, with people that share the same vision, let's say. Um, so 
I am um, a free, um, freelance, so uh, independent researcher. And uh, I have the pleasure to work in uh, and to teach inside the Master of Science Communication, which is held in Trieste in a research center called CISA. Um, I have the head of scientific communicator here now, so I want to share some thoughts that you know came up in my mind. Um, so first, uh, mm, okay, when I, I use uh, artistic languages to teach, so sorry, to, to communicate science and technology to different publics, and sometimes I also bring uh, some artistic projects already made to communicate such a, a topic or whatever, no? So um, this allowed me to, to go through different projects, starts projects, but not, not only. And um, somehow what uh, I find in my experience is that different publics need different projects, okay? Even if they deal with the same topic. Um, so regarding lo uh, local citi uh, citizens' engagement and outreach, uh, my question is, could future STARS projects be uh, more aware on, on this, on the of the communication in different uh, for for different publics, somehow, maybe in the call could be also asked the art the artist to be more clear in what what is uh, his own reason to to talk with the people. Okay, um, so this one, um, in the end, w what I <laughs> my vision is that uh, through art is it possible it's possible to give so the citizens and society the tools cultural tools to understand technology and science and so to be involved in the future innovation uh, also in politics and what in ev every every single field so uh, we need also to uh, as you said before um, you need to uh, know the impact of an art project, of an uh, art science project. Um, as a science in science communication, this is the this is normal. Uh, if you do a project, there is a survey always that must be done to evaluate what you do. Otherwise, uh, there is no point. There is no research in that. So uh, maybe also in the call could be mm, could be a science communicator involved inside this art and science uh, research my question. Maybe it's useful, maybe not. Um, last, uh, um, we, I think in every field, especially in science, uh, scientists tend to, to be, them to, to close themselves in a tower and tends to be like, we know everything and we must speak to the world and teach the world. So this is wrong for me, for also uh, this is why the science communication grew up uh, much in the last years. Um, so the tendency to build a bubble is very is a is a danger, dangerous thing. So uh, some artistic projects that came out from stars activities uh, they are very much artistic, and sometimes the feeling is that for for what was the the ad for uh, research uh, scientific research. Of course, we need to understand that um, this is the problem also of base research in, uh, in science. We have to deal with serendipity, so maybe something coming out, maybe not, and uh, this is already known, I think, in the community. So um, the tendency to build a bubble and say, okay, we have done this, we are very good, but uh, maybe the outreach is not that we wanted or we aimed, so be aware on this about this, because it could be a dangerous thing, in my opinion. Happy to discuss about this. Thank you. Next, we have Ariane Dio. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here today because I'm following, I'm not part of the, the start, not yet. Uh, even by, I, uh, I have a, a similar spirit, uh, of course, but um, uh, I'm following your actions, the actions of starts, 
uh, for many from the beginning, I guess. Um, and I am more from the side of the Creative Europe program and project, so from the artistic side. Uh, I previously was um, a coordinator of uh, the Institute Network uh, for the artistic creation in public space. That means creation in, uh, in a wide range, uh, really interdisciplinary. Uh, and then I also had the chance to uh, be the cultural manager for the implementation of the European Capital of Culture in, uh, in Italy, Matera 2019, some years ago. So through uh, this European project, I mean really a cooperation project, platform project, um, and uh, European Capital of Culture, uh, there is a lot of uh, process and experience as well from the side, uh, from the artistic side, but linked with uh, social issues, uh, climate change issues. So I guess we are talking always uh, about the same thing. So uh, from, uh, from my side today, I'm really wondering why <laughs> this Creative Europe project are not so connected uh, with the STARTS project. So this is uh, an issue, I guess, uh, could be really valuable to connect and bridge, and this, uh, I guess, could be uh, a suggestion to the European Commission uh, to uh, try to connect and uh, make them work together. Uh, uh, we are able to make them work, but uh, they, they should be aware about uh, how valuable could be in bridging this project. And Related to what I heard uh, this morning, um, uh, I heard uh, that there is this problem of uh, the final event uh, and reaching the audience. Um, yes, of course, because it's an experimental part, it's the residency, there is not enough time to experiment, uh, and then the event is made uh, a little bit at the last moment. Um, so my question is, why not, because there are a lot of artists also uh, working with participatory projects. They already have their communities. They're, they are used for many years in involving uh, audiences, communities, uh, uh, local systems, um, kilowatts know it very well. <laughs> uh, so uh, for the next step, why not, uh, I, I would be a little bit radical, why not starting from the artist doing uh, open call to um, technicians or uh, scientists? Uh, <coughs> could also be both, of course, on both senses. Uh, because that could also uh, open science to another kind of audience uh, and also learn about other processes. So it's, uh, I would say uh, it could be, uh, if it is not becoming a, a, a easy policy, um, this could be an, an engagement uh, from both sides to uh, collaborate closer because uh, creative project, uh, creative Europe projects um, are financed on the long term, uh, so they also have time and they are able to build uh, their communities. So uh, and trust and also uh, they are used to work together. So um, it's really a resources that should be uh, uh, rely on. Uh, so that's for the open discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ariane, very interesting. And I think we have uh, a last person that said they before you raise your hand, yes. Uh, thank you for that opportunity. My name is Robert Ferch and I'm um, like uh, I'm 
not part of the Stats family. Um, I'm speaking today maybe on behalf of a really a grassroots movement that tries to step in this art science uh, collaboration. I'm coming from Club Solitaire from uh, Chemnitz. Um, we are an 11-year-old uh, association mainly working in culture and context of our city. And the city is has been an industrial place now with a huge technical university. Um, so it changed from this really production to researching and to being kind of in high-tech um, space. But it lacks basically any aesthetic, poetic reflection. Um, so basically what is all like very familiar to you and what we're discussing today he, um, here, there is like where aliens there is thinking uh, thinking of this anyhow people were demanding for an art school um, and now this is a tricky issue because there are two very big and famous art schools nearby um, and people thought okay maybe if we have another art school in Chemnitz that would give us some glamour um, we as an, an association we hardly doubt that but we took the chance starting prototyping some of these events as also you do um, bringing artists to the labs of the local um, university and research institutes we work together with Fraunhofer institutes um, and bringing artists there, always trying not only to have this um, one residency, but to um, have a broad context. So we always have a, res a research residency that leads into a research question, opening up for um, students to take part in some workshops or as we do at the moment in collaboration with Ars Electronica and Raw Art Center um, in, a, in a broader summer school, which brought um, 30 international young um, students at the moment or um, participants to um, three different Fraunhofer laboratories. Um, and uh, anyhow, I wanted to come to the point, um, I, I find it still pretty much challenging in this, I would still consider as a peripher peripheral area. So um, even close to a rural area because it's a weird place there. Um, and uh, you might know that Chemnitz is um, a call to be Chem uh, European Capital of Culture in 2025. So there is now this chance al also to address these challenges because there is um, the topic of makerism, self-sufficiency, um, and creativity in places where you don't see it. But for us, um, also connecting to programs like STARTS or like to finding these partners in these consortiums, I think in the rural and peripheral areas is like a really uh, tough challenge and I would love to know or maybe to find ways how to broaden these contacts, how to involve more people and how to involve them um, yeah, um, along not only at the centers which are also uh, already maybe more uh, established. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we can hear. Um, would anybody like to respond to any of the points that they were brought up? Any comments, any inputs? Hi, I'm Paolo Pilazza. I, I'm not a part of any program yet. I have a creative studio that works for science communication and uh, the several of the topics that have been uh, displayed today are a common problem for what for me are clients now but i i would like to be more than that and uh, all and by the way um addressing these problems from an art standpoint would uh, extremely benefit them in order to disseminate also the research that they do and um Talking about the process uh, and considering the process as part of the opus, it's also very important to give a, a long tail to this type of projects because, as he said, if, uh, if the whole um, initiative becomes the show and not what happens in the middle, there's a lot of people that remains on the street and do doesn't catch uh, the, the whole concept. I, I've been in, in meetings for creative uh, Europe uh, projects uh, to create other type of consortiums and everything. And sometimes I was struggling to understand what the members of the consortium were, were trying to say. And, uh, and uh, I was part of these calls in order to disseminate what the project was about. And if I, I struggle to understand what they are trying to say, imagine someone that does, has no idea what the project is about. 
So this is, uh, this is one thing. And the other thing in terms of the relationship between artists and, and uh, science and technology is that we're living in a world uh, that has uh, an exponential growth of technology, but a linear understanding uh, in terms of society. And this acceleration is getting more and more noticeable. For example, the, the project that we, s we saw today that took months, uh, four years ago, today is really, we don't even need uh, the, the person interpreting, the, the actor right now, for example. And what worries me is the knowledge gap that artists have uh, regarding of the tools at disposal because um, catching up, it will take a long time and uh, I don't know if it's enough time in one of these projects to actually understand what can be done with the current tools. So that will probably take some extra effort in terms of uh, education and technology transfer is called in from the scientific point of view, but uh, nobody talks about uh, te uh, technology transfer in the arts. So maybe I don't know if this is something that it's being talked about, but uh, I think it's really worrying also because uh, it's almost like magic for someone. And, but uh, for me, it's existential because uh, I have to profit, uh, but uh, it takes me a lot of my time every day and an artist needs to um, leverage this type of tools uh, because they, the, their ability and sensi sensitivity may actually find the new uses that people that is too inside cannot see. That's perhaps. Just like the, from the point of view of technological person, in a way, it's the same for engineers. We all time have to catch up. So it's not like only artists. And it always, it is just like the dedication. And if you are speaking about specific tools, uh, if pe some people are an experts in this, I would say just go to experts because they are up to date with, with everything. Because otherwise, if you are trying to pick up new tools, it's even if you are a researcher and you are doing science and you want to go into a specific no domain, let's say neuroscience. Right now, even if you like had the knowledge of neuroscience, like let's say one year ago or even half a year ago, with the AI and everything, this it's so fast that it's not only artists. It's like it's for everyone. So it just requires work. There is no like easy solution. There's always pressure to kind of know everything, right? Um, like as an artist, like, oh yeah, now I have to know about AI, data, we also generate deep fakes and all this. But I think for myself, I found a way, collaboration. If there is new area, I have no energy to go in, but it's I'm kind of curious. Work with person who knows it, but also we pick things that's relevant to our practice because the practice is a kind of linear thing. Maybe it sounds like it's scattered, but it's linear. So pick stuff that's interesting and then kind of just function, otherwise it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> but collaboration really, really helps. Just work with people who know it, and then you find common ground, and you do weird stuff together, I guess. <laughs> Suggestion. <laughs> Uh, this is a question from total ignorance because uh, maybe, maybe it's very the uh, answer already, but does the, the science part of these programs uh, share the technology stack that the artists can use in order to you know, understand if they are a good fit for that specific prog program or, or not? Because you know, some it depends on the type of uh, op opera, what's the name? In a, Art piece, thank you, that you want to do the, the type of technological stack that, that might be needed. So uh, I don't know if it's something that it's uh, thought beforehand or it's something that happens spontaneously. 
high. Uh, yeah, it probably depends on, on each project and each artist and each, each uh, scientific community. But for example, in in our part, we we kind of uh, introduced certain uh, technologies and like for example, Print Lab or Arctic Drone Lab or or, or these kind of scientific and technological labs with the artists who could discuss that that what would we, what would do they want to do, and then we also have a part of the budget so that the the staff can or we can actually buy working time from the staff to mentor the artist. So I mean, probably everybody does their own way, but this is how we are doing in this project. Great. Um, sorry, I have to step in. Thank you, everybody, for the input. Very interesting ideas. I suggest we keep all these points in mind as we uh, move on to the next session. And then just keep in mind that we have time at the end. There's a networking cocktail where we can keep discussing all these very interesting issues. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay, so we are ready to start the final panel. Um, let's see what it was. Um, so, yeah, the, your points have been very useful, I think, for giving us some food for thoughts now. I think the, the panelists could also uh, take some uh, of the flesh out to, to influence their own speech. Um, so, let me start introducing uh, the panelists. We have online connected. Uh, so if we can show him, uh, we have Peter Fries from the European Commission. Peter is Senior Program Officer for Innovation in Social Media and Starts Initiative at the Directorate General Connect of the European Commission in Brussels. Uh, before he was working from the start from 12 years in Internet of Things domain and driving uh, the European Commission on IoT Innovation and Policy Program. Here with me we have Anne Obrecht. Uh, she is uh, responsible for the Digital Art Department for the Ministry of Culture of the Federation Wallonia Brussels, uh, within which she developed the support system and actively promotes supported artists and operators. Alessandra Gariboldi. Um, she's an highly experienced senior researcher and consultant specialized in the field of visitor studies and cultural project evaluation. And she serves as president of the Fondazione Fitzcarraldo, uh, as well as the head of transnational project. And she collaborates closely uh, with the Cultural Observatory of Piedmont in Italy. And today she is representing the AIT for culture and creativity. Uh, and Veronica Liebel, Director of European Cooperation at Ars Electronica. Uh, she studied economics and business science, and she is working since 10 years in Ars Electronica, engaged in programming and producing collaborative program with partners from our science and industry, and facilitating the artistic production and knowledge incubation. And last but not least, Florian Schneider, professor at the art in art and theory and documentary practice at the the Trodenheim Academy of Fine Arts within the Faculty of Architecture and Fine Art at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. So now we are really, uh, we are really going into um, a deep discussion because we had very useful insight of all over the day. Um, one of the comments made by the speaker from the first panel uh, was really interesting. The projects are just a tool to create a community. And this is true, I mean. Um, we are, are sometimes going from one project to another. What is important is that no, n there are no project attempts without a follow-up. And the creation of the community is one of the most relevant things we have to take care of, even if somehow it's uh, quite difficult to keep the community together and keep working on the enlargement of the community. Um, we also discussed several issues. The economic impact that is useful to legitimize the C CI sector and also the, the framework of the starts um, and the role of institution. So 
In some cases, we saw the example of ACTE. We mentioned Barcelona as uh, one of the good examples where institutions are embedded, in the political uh, parties are embedded in the creation of those ecosystems, but there are still some local ecosystem, and also Borut mentioned it, where public institutions are not really engaged and embedded. So the aim of this panel today is to closing, summarizing a bit also in terms of policies and initiatives, what we can do. So as a, con as a community, what we can offer to the policymakers, and, but also what we expect from poli policymakers. It came out during the day several times, how starts will evolve, uh, how starts will be framed also in other technical calls, for instance. So I think we can start directly uh, with Peter. Um, thank you, Peter, for being online all the day, following the discussion. Um, I will start immediately. So first of all, giving us some input about these 10 years of start. So how did you connect mm -hmm. receive the framework, which are the value, but also which are the things that you think from your perspective sh still should be uh, investigated, let's say. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon uh, from Brussels. Um, Simona, team, uh, thanks a lot to Fondazione Giorgio Gini. Um, your panelists, some are known person, some I see for the first time. Happy to at least see you virtually. Um, I was following um, to a bigger extent uh, discussions and just before also of today. So I think I got a fairly good impression what uh, what discussed. Um, everybody asks now what is the future of START as uh, my colleague Ralph Dam uh, left the European Commission. And um, what I'm always going to say is that as such, um, even if there have, has been some maybe turmoil, overall the uh, Commission supports starts. Nevertheless, uh, like was discussed before, starts is um, an interesting but challenging um, endeavor. And like many of you need to defend it or um, are in, in favor, but need really to argue uh, for it. The same happens to us, and um, like you were saying, starts uh, started up, um, approximately ten years ago. Via some first projects, were basically the idea was to think differently about innovation, and I think even until today, that's also why maybe starts is not um, one to one with the, the European Bauhaus or the culture and creative industries. The basic idea is to say bring in a different kind of thinking in. Uh, product, product development, and all kinds of working processes in our society. And of course, at the end, in industrial and uh, business projects. Um, I think like was said today, often the starts still always had also a societal perspective saying at the end, art, create the creation of art is a, a beautiful topic, a beautiful thing. It's part which is uh, very specific to humanity. And that's what we are. It's, it's our history, it's our future, it's the cultural part. And we want to, uh, to link this to um, our innovation and, and to, uh, society policy in Europe. And of course, I guess, like you, the challenge we have often is to also explain that art is maybe not only sculpture or photography or uh, painting, it's something else. And then, then parallel to um, starts there's the art market there's many things going on which actually makes it quite quite interesting what um i can say i was browsing quickly before uh, that over the past 10 years we invested approximately uh, um, over 30 million euros in all kinds of different projects you have seen a few of them today it's um and when i discussed with ralph years ago it was always to have a um, portfolio of uh, starts activities and you know that certainly uh, as well uh, myself that the variety makes the, the beauty and the difference so we have thematic projects for example on water on food on um, sound in the city we have uh, projects which are also linking more to societal issues um, inclusion we have uh, the prices and i realized that uh, now more and more artists are very proud to be 
at least having a mention or even winning a, a starts price. We have two prices per year and the prices are going to continue next year. Uh, we have also um, what we call Start Academy, which is also linking to curriculum development as in many universities and academic places. Um, a starts perspective or starts education is not um, evident. Um, not to for forgotten that Start has an international outreach, both that we are having projects where we uh, collaborate with other regions in the world, but also that in terms of um, artistic residences, which are a huge pillar of Start's, uh, in, so as I went correctly, the participation can be from worldwide uh, proposers. Uh, of course, there are some practicalities, but we go beyond a Euro, um, European horizon. I think also to be said that um, starts is a true endeavor where we have a, or at least we achieve a, a gender equality, which in many other cases and also um, political subjects the commission supporting is not uh, automatically the case so i think we can be proud that in starts we at least on this important thing about gender equality um we are, we have well advanced um i think today you have seen um, examples from projects you have uh, heard project coordinators you have seen the, the starts prices i think this year have quite two interesting prices uh, the video from richard moss and also the um, ai application from alexander Beige ginsburg and there are many more interesting uh, mentions, which of course can be studied and were at the Ars Electronica Festival at this play. Um, the challenge is often how to get starts started, right? And uh, I guess there's no one and only way, um, but certainly it's a crystallization point where um, maybe there's access to infrastructures, there is an interest in university to work transdisciplinary. There might be foundations who are very supportive. There might be art museums which uh, open or, or offer residencies. There's interesting festivals which um, provide a huge um, sounding board for uh, attracting artists. And that's why in, in many cases, a, a possibility, getting a possibility of um, Purging resources and getting more uh, players involved is um, is a way forward, right? In this respect, um, I think what is often important is to understand the different nature of uh, people involved, be it uh, from the artist side, the scientific side, the innovators. I think that was also nicely explained this morning. And of course, we have different cultures involved. We have different. Uh, sensibilities and different uh, ways also to show respect to somebody else but ultimately there are many people in the start environment uh, who can do so and those are the people so it's also important to find the right people to um, to work on starts and to bring starts um, start forward um, what I want to also maybe to ask you for for later is certainly that as from Horizon Europe, we are now entering uh, the work program discussion 25 to 27. Um, it's certainly interesting to get your input um, on what um, START should be working on. I think the last prominent topic is certainly generative AI. Another important uh, topic is, um, or important but least prominent topic is all around uh, metaverse discussion. We have uh, issues on, of course, surveillance, on social inclusion, et cetera. So I think there are interesting topics where certainly we can have a look what we should finance in the next work program. But what is also interesting is that um, um, I'm happy we, we are going to, to work on a uh, START book. I think START is a unique uh, initiative uh, worldwide. And uh, I'm looking forward that we have very nice documentation where we really also connect all those interesting bits and pieces of the past 10 years. And that certainly can be very helpful for uh, new players and people interested to how to get started and to convince uh, other people. What I sometimes would wish more is that um, it feels to me often that we preaching inside starts understanding what starts is. And so we say, yes, um, that's beautiful. I guess um, the more we can um, getting other people outside the starts uh, field involved, interested, curious, participating. I think the more we win. And uh, given the um, the topics, for example, like on, on water management, we have certain interesting 
things to show and to get the audience involved. So my wish would be for starts, as it's not and has never been a commission or any kind of exercise, it's certainly important that we all try to, to promote starts um, outside uh, established starts community. Because if that's what we want, we want to create the impact and, uh, and get more people involved. And I think I would just close on these words. Thank you. So thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, um, involvement of other kind of audience in the start. So, so some uh, remind what we discussed about the bubble. So, so yes. Um, and just taking a step back to ask you something else about the the funding schemes. So you mentioned the next world program, uh, 25, 26. Um, you are also asking for the um, kind of input from the community. I think we are all very happy to contribute with some insight. Uh, the question maybe is, uh, so if you are mentioning the, some topics like regenerative AI, metaverse, so you think, can you see more the starts framework in the frame of other code maybe? So more than a vertical starts um, dedicated funding schemes, more something like starts apply to other technology, technological causes, is this correct? And I also take the opportunity to ask you something about how do you see the starts framework in relation to other, um, other kind of uh, funding opportunities like Creative Europe, because we also had a comment about the fact that maybe starts is not very much connected to others. So how do you see starts with Creative Europe, European Bauhaus, uh, so because we talk about the European Bauhaus and the fact that we should talk in order to avoid lack of communication, the replication of the same initiative. So what's your point on this? Um, I think the European Commission is quite um, a complex body. And um, I guess uh, like in many big organizations, we are permanently striving between having synergies and uh, cohesion or coherence, but at the same time to avoid um, a total centralized approach, which means that um, there are always several, sometimes even uh, at least on paper, similar initiatives, how um, European Commission supports culture and, and, and the arts. Um, and, and I think we will always have that. Um, for me, it has two, two points. First of all, it's good that there are several possibilities and entrance doors because players are different, organizations are different. Historically, they have maybe different competences. So I have no problem that there is a parallel existence between, for example, European Bauhaus, the cultural and creative industries, and also Creative Europe. And it can also be that um, we are in a political domain where um, many subjects, um, like in, in waves going up and down or a bit more, a bit less visible, and that can change often very quickly. So it's sometimes good if there are several um, funding possibilities, and of course not to be forgotten, the regional national uh, activities or private activities, that if one activity is a bit less um, promising for a moment, other activities can take this up. So in concrete terms, um, I know that, for example, Creative Europe is financing quite a number of activities around artificial intelligence which we uh, from uh, DG Connect do a bit less for the moment, right? So um, the last call, we are more going for um, residencies, um, the start price, but also not for forgotten, a AI music festival, which nobody does. And I think I would more prefer to see this pluralism instead of saying how um, redundancy can be uh, can be resolved because uh, my experience is that's very difficult and maybe sometimes wrongly invested um, energy. Now, if it comes to starts, uh, there's a in the framework. It, it's not easy to say is it more vertical, is it more horizontal, right? Um, I feel that there was maybe a moment where starts needed to consolidate itself as a as an activity maybe to support uh, um, product development, to, to work on interesting topics, to also go into processes. And one good thing was certainly the, the, the residences and uh, the mapping. As it moves on, it also 
is that if we stay in a start bubble and think we are our framework, we might be a bit less uh, successful. And that's why my colleague had started together with you to work on um, on dedicated topics. Uh, what I also see is that uh, we have um, a few new project coordinators and newcomers in the Starts family, which is beautiful, and so rightly so, and I'm even going to have a meeting after this hour discussion. They're asking how can we um, have a stronger impact in Starts and with Starts, which means for me it's a bit both. Maybe it's, uh, looking for interesting topics, sometimes verticals, where Starts can really connect to things uh, what it is, right? It's about innovation and uh, stimulating a different thinking. It's not that starts nationally is working on the next uh, cultural revolution. It's uh, bringing in thinking for uh, industrial and uh, and business processes. And secondly, if then we have new um, family members we want, or new um, people being involved, if there's a framework, if, the, if there is a family, a corporate, if there is tools and orientation, on communication, um, this can be helpful to to, to uh, include uh, in a nice way uh, new members. So I would see this coexistence more uh, in a positive way than saying uh, we need to streamline and, and harmonize everything. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, as you are connected now, uh, I would like to ask now the the, the floor if you, the audience if you have any question for uh, for Peter Fries. Otherwise, we will go to the to, to the second panel, to the second panelist. Sorry. Okay, no question for the moment. So, Peter, I ask, I thank you very much um, for on behalf of all of us for giving uh, for giving this uh, insightful contribution. Um, so, thank you. If you want to say, and uh, we can collect other thing, other questions at the end. Um, and now I'm going directly to Anne. Because the, when we uh, discussed it this morning, the introduction of the day, we discussed about connecting dots. And we know that policy uh, support from the European Commission is, um, is a bit for granted because the European Commission started this, uh, this framework. But on the other hand, we really need to focus on the level of, uh, of another level of policy, which is the regional one. So this is why we are happy to have you here, Hanne. Um, and the question for you is really how to, to give us an example of how your um, department, so how the Federation Wallonia Brussels is supporting uh, digital arts, creating a common, uh, creating a kind of connection among different <coughs> fields. So how you are taking this framework somehow and, and applying it to the local uh, base where of your territory. Thank you, Simona. So um, thank you for the invitation too, for this very interesting day. I'm happy to present you today how the Brussels Wallonia Federation supports digital arts. Uh, the Brussels Wallonia Federation is the Ministry of Culture for the French-speaking people of Belgium. Since 2006, we do support digital art, digital art with a specific dedicated program for digital art organization, digital art work projects, and digital art events, like exhibition or workshop. The budget increased rapidly each year. We started about, it was about 85,000 euro the first year, and now it amounts to 800,000 euro. Uh, about two-thirds of that budget is for the structurally supported organization, IMAL, that both of you, most of you know already in Brussels, KIC in Namur, which is more creative industry than only artistic part, and Constant, which is uh, more on the political uh, uh, work with uh, technology. Uh, about 300,000 euro are for the art project. Uh, research grants, artwork at different level, designing, production, distribution, and promotion, and events. How does it work? Three times a, a year, 
uh, the application of submitted to a board of experts composed of Belgian producers, artists, and curators, and their proposals are then submitted to the ministry, which decides. 99% of the time, the ministry just follow the proposal. I mean, I've been working there for 25 years, and it was always an agreement. So, but technically, she's the one who decides. Our main objective, we have two, four. <laughs> the first one is support innovation. And I give you two, two or three examples. We recently found uh, an organization called OM, and it's an it initiative of the scientific world toward the arts, which is new for us, because usually it's artistic um, organization which try to connect with uh, the scientific world. And this time it's a bit different. It's a team of engineer, uh, engineers and cultural professionals, and it's a really aim art, science, production, research, and education, divided in those three poles. Production company that develops installation, performances, event, and exhibition, and accompanies the artists. So basically, it's a residences, and the artists with whom choose which technical um, uh, technician could help and what technology is the most suitable. Educational and Research Institute that develops academic programs and encourage transdisciplinary research between art and science. And finally, Research and Development Center that develops technology and offers design, prototyping, and manufacturing service for artists and designers. The main point is that OM investigates the boundaries between artistic and scientific di discipline. And um, this involves exploring new practices of scientific mediation, artistic creation. We support them with uh, uh, the amount of 40,000 euro a year, so which was um, concretely, it was uh, the um, residencies for five Belgian artists, a, m a major exhibition. Uh, so another way to support innovation is to uh, give a research grant for artists. One is called the Ether. It's made by Claire Williams and Deborah Levy. It's a space for the preservation and reactivation of the technique of the invisible found in the archive of the experimental and occult science in the 19th and 20th century. In effect, there would be no telephone or telegraph if there had not been spiritual communications and medium. Just to remind you that in the 19th century, we made stable move by touching each other <laughs> and communicate with the other world. And so on, the both, on both sides of the line, we know how between science and non-science, the research of the invisible were driven by the same ambition to reveal a world imperceptible to humans. So the project is about um, investigate occult chemistry, aura, Electrophotography, concave mirror that alters space time, astral travel in parallel realities, spiritism, instrumental transcommunication, remote vision, exoplasm materialization, mass telepathy using radio, radionic. So it's another way to explore the past with a direct link to our, to our current world. And it's also a way to promote what the, those women did, because mostly it was women. So another uh, good, in a good example is the grant for Alex Verat. Maybe you know her. 
And the project is called, I just I forgot to give the amount, but it's about 15,000 euro for the first project. It's uh, for the time, the time to, to research, to document. Uh, for Alex, it's 10,000 euro, and um, the name of the project is The Sea is Inside of You, and uh, it's a very feministic project. It's to reveal the, the connection between the sea of information that constitutes artificial intelligence and the philosophy of hydrofeminism. So the water inside of us, specifically women, and the sea of um, artificial intelligence. What is there a connection? What is it? And so she, um, she will need first technical education, first research, of course, in that field, and experimentation, and uh, she would create uh, an art piece at the end, something similar to Julie Stephen Schenk's fantastic Uromado project. And uh, I she will uh, make an exhibition after that and uh, make an exhibition project to document it, the, to, comment, uh, to explain about the project and to show the results. And the third um, grant we gave it's to Laure Winot, 40,000 euro, and she develops her work as a political place to explore, experiment elements, light and space. And now she is invited uh, in, um, in atmospheric observatory, working di directly in the field with climate scientists from uh, SNRS, which is a uh, uh, scientific found uh, in research in Belgium. So she works with climate scientists, geographers, and speculative philosophers. So that was the first um, aim to support in the innovation. And the second one is to, diff to support different approaches in digital world. So as I told you before, we support um, three organizations. The first one is IMAL, which is a space for artistic practices around the creative and critical use of new technology. Um, IMAL is directly connected to the latest artistic practice, social trends, and technology development. So of course they organize residences, workshop, exhibition, and so on. The second one, Kik, is a bit different. It's committed to building bridges between the arts, science, culture, and technology. It organized each year a huge, a huge, I mean huge in Namur is <laughs> <laughs> it's never huge at least in Los Angeles, but I mean big for Namur, uh, which showcase digital practices in the broader sense. It can go to, to design, to art, to photography, to, to business also. Uh, for its 11th in edition in 2002, it even it attracted over 25,000 visitors, which is really big for Belgium. And there is, there are, they are also a partner of a Fab Lab, a Media Lab, and since last year, they have a permanent um, place called Le Pavillon, which is a permanent exhibition space that mixes art, science, and technology. And the third one, Constant, is a non-profit organization based in Brussels since 1997, and which is active in the fields of art, media, and technology, but uh, they, um, they're more specifically engaged with practice from or within feminism, and uh, um, they are inspired by, by the principle of copyleft, free and le um, open source software, and formulating their own critique to artists. And, um, uh -huh. and they organize transdisciplinary uh, open-ended work sessions, which is the main aspect of their world. They put together <coughs> artists, scientific researchers, 
to, to think about it, just to exchange. Um, so they work with feminist servers situated to publishing active archives, institutional network, relearning situation, hackable devices, performative protocols, solidarity infrastructure, and other spongy practices to stake out paths towards speculative uh, free intersectional technologies. So it's more political. The third objective is bringing digital artworks closer to the audience. Because uh, in Belgium, well, in French-speaking Belgium, most of the art is shown in the capital, Brussels. And so um, there is a, a hole. So what about our people living elsewhere? So uh, we, we, we launched a call for other kind of structure that was in 2013. And since then, um, any kind of organization can uh, submit to make a digital art event, even if it, the organization is not uh, into art at for the beginning. So uh, each year we, we uh, support different um, um, different events in, in workshop mostly or also project for young people from 12 to 22 to promote the discovery of digital uh, potential. But we also support laser talks. Maybe some of you already know laser talks, scientific uh, world together to artists, humanists, and technology for informal presentation. And the last uh, goal is to bridge with other artistic practice, not to put digital art in, a, in another little bubble beside uh, photo. And, and so we, we supported projects different, for example, one with a puppet show, and how the puppet show are connected to digital art with robotics. And the last one is an artist called Laura Colmenares Guerra. She's um, about ecosystem and how it's happening in Amazonia now and how the digital tools can show more the um, destruction of the, of the place over there. And I'm finished, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving a glimpse of how you are implementing support uh, to digital arts in Brussels and Bologna uh, department. Um, and now we are going to another stream of another policy level, let's say. So Alessandra, I'm coming back to you to discuss about uh, the AIT for creative and cultural industries. We know that has been a big achievement for the community. Um, so if you can give us, as we are always interested in terms of funding and how things will be supported also from the kick side, okay. if you can Money give Money next us year, just okay. so. <laughs> That's super, so. so. So I've got 10 minutes, <laughs> but in the meantime, so it's not, a, it's not a, you know, I, I'm not, it's, it's a little bit yeah, so tell us more. to go to the end, so let you wait nine minutes and 30 seconds to know that money will come okay. next year. So tell, tell us <laughs> about money, which is super interesting, and also <laughs> which is uh, how the kicks want to, um, what the kicks wants to achieve with the two very relevant uh, tools, let's say, that they are building, the investment club and the policy club. Okay, so, um, well, first of all, I've got a sh very short presentation just to give you a glimpse because maybe um, it's not a given that everybody knows what the EIT Culture and Creativity is. Um, the EIT is an initiative in the frame of the European Union and there are, and they establish, they basically exist to promote innovation and competitiveness of Europe, okay? so. That's the framework, and it's important to know that because all what happens afterwards really comes from this, stem from this premise. Um, the, they established over the years uh, nine kicks. Our kick is the, ni is the ninth. So um, kicks are, are um, knowledge and innovation communities, basically partnerships 
institutional partnerships that are expected to last between seven or seven plus seven in the best case years, uh, whose um, aim is to promote innovation uh, within a certain ecosystem. So there are kicks for the one of the first was climate, and health, um, raw material, uh, manufacturing, okay? So these are the kind of ecosystems they usually deal with. So the, fact, the same fact of having a cultural creativity uh, kick was a huge achievement because it made recognize that cultural creativity were actually an ecosystem bringing value uh, with a huge potential of innovation for the entire uh, society. Um, and also with economic capacity of producing returns of investment. So this is basically what, uh, how, how did it start? But um, let's say most of us, and I'm looking to Veronica, but also um, Florian and somewhere else who's here that was, was partnering uh, of, the, of the kick. So we, we are now 50 partners. Um, basically, we started like in 2018, 2019, trying to co-design how this community made of publisher, digital designers, enterprises, universities, uh, designers, architects, uh, heritage professional, you know, game designer, uh, coders, whatever you can imagine, mm, be in the same frame. Which is something that has something, let's say, it's a kind of a dream, could also be kind of a nightmare because as you can imagine, okay, you were, I, I, I spent a lot of time this morning listening to you, how it's difficult to all the communication, so the artist, uh, the, the entrepreneur or the tech, so there is all of that at exponential level, <laughs> okay? So uh, this is more or less what, uh, what the story is. We try to co-design something that could put together all our ambitions but I think that uh, there's a long way to go. We are still a very long way to go. So we are um, so many and so different, really as different you, as you can imagine. Uh, but I mean, we won the bid precisely because we said that we were different and preso precisely because we value diversity. And diversity means that uh, it's business and non-business, it's art based and heritage, is mm, really the hard industry of audiovisual publishing, so the old art industry and the newest one, okay, that is the encompassing diversity. Also because this sector is the most fragmented one mm, existing. So 90% is made of small or extremely small micro enterprises or individuals are actually the ones who create value within this system. Um, so uh, the, after winning the bid, we are now in the process of building the, all the legal structures, which are eight, so six co-location centers in six um, cities across Europe, and a central, um, well, two actual legal entities in Cologne, and we are about to deliver the strategic plan to the EIT that based on that will fund, hopefully, <laughs> no, I'm joking, they will fund the activities in the next years. And our activities will be mainly supporting education, innovation, creation, and what we call society, which is a kind of a fourth pillar, um, meaning that the uh, innovations that stem from our activities, the, the activities that the EIT does fund uh, others or own initiatives together with others, basically aim to solve the triple transition, the, so the environmental and social challenges. Mm? So quite in, uh, I mean, in line with, uh, along with the, both the Bauhaus and uh, and the, the starts project contents actually, so quite in line with that. 
uh, basically the opportunity will be open calls um, that will be, m let's say, between the first and the second quarter of 2024. There will be open calls. And they will be open calls for creating education and training paths and vocational training and innovation system, incubation system. So you can imagine whatever you want because basically most of these things will be there. Uh, meaning that probably there will not be, for example, calls for artistic creation in digital, but plenty of room for artistic creation in digital within other projects with some aim. Because this somehow, what Starts did was uh, uh, prototyping and iterating and, and, and innovating in a, in a kind of a, let's say, frame, a framework that you gave, but that framework can fit almost whatever meaning that putting together creativity, tech, and social challenges, or business challenges, or whatever, is basically a way of doing. So you learned plenty of things, and those things, especially when I was listening to the conversation this morning, I was saying, wow, I want to listen to this kind of conversation into the ITP, culture and creativity, because these are, I mean, the topics we must, topics on ethics, the topics on, you know, because, Yes, I, I was, of course, when you were mentioning this morning, so innovation and progress. I think we've got a long, we've got a very long way to go in terms of clarifying and cleaning the thinking, not just, you know, making sure that we are all talking about the same things, which is not a given again. Second opportunity is the investment network. Because of this diversity, profit and not profit, little, big, uh, artistic, heritage, social innovation, businesses of all kind, um, we need to deploy very different uh, financial frameworks. Because if you think about the system as an ecosystem, this diversity should be sustained with a different set of tools. So we've got very ambitious objectives in terms of raising funds, raising money, which is one of the objectives of, of the EIT. So raising investments, because that this is how you do development. But uh, if you acknowledge that there are plenty of things that can't be found, are not investable. So artistic innovation, first of all, is not necessarily social innovation, which is not necessarily business innovation, which is not necessarily, not even in that case, because you can be business innovation, so, but you can be not interesting, for example, for investors while we also need those, okay? So a very different set of. And this is just started. And the second uh, thing is the policy, what we now call regions and cities network. Basically putting together, there's an open call, by the way, which is always open for policy makers at the regional or city level to join. It's a very, let's say, peer-to-peer -peer group where a policymaker interested in developing um, policies for the cultural and creative ecosystem can meet, exchange, and develop together frameworks to sustain this kind of development, so art and culture-based development. Um, because we realized since the beginning that without that, I was listening also this morning, and it was very interesting, but I coming to the impact, I was thinking not just impact on communities, but you can't involve communities if you can't then promise or secure that what you are promising is going to happen. And you can redesign you know, your bus stops in an amazing, funny, engaging ways to make people willing to go by public transport. But if you don't have the city with you, what are we talking about? Okay, so I can make you the bus stop very nice and creative and also transformative or whatever, but in the end, if you don't have any investment in public transport, what? So that's the point, okay? So creating the conditions so that those kind of innovation can become systemic. And uh, the next renaissance you already know is, is basically a narrative which should be basically nurtured by all projects like yours, telling a story about our, our um, human-centered um, approaches can, let's say, renew mm, this new narrative. And then becoming a member from, from the beginning of 24, you will be uh, 
everybody will be allowed to join as a partner. One of the great differences from the previous kick is that the partnership acknowledging that there are very, very little subjects and it's quite diverse, so you can't have a, a huge design firm and a single coder or, or performing artist <laughs> uh, join, then the, the fees are quite diverse because they reflect, let's say, that diversity. So becoming a member could be a way of, let's say, having a say. Given said, which is new, so just to say that being partner doesn't give you no, any money, okay? Just gives you voice into the strategic design and development of where the kick goes. That's that. That's uh, but of course it's network, it's opportunities, it's all all that stuff. But uh, we will see. Now we are 50. In three years, we should become like 200 or so. Don't remember exactly, but many. So th this is more or less the key. Thank you, Alessandra. Um, as we are running out of time, very quick question and a quick reaction uh, about the role of the six local regional centers. I mean, I know they are under uh, they are under construction. Yeah, yeah under construction. They are under construction. Uh, which are the most urgent issue, in your opinion, they have to... Yeah, to because of course, uh, one of the things is that all the people working in the managing, uh, in the managing organization based in Cologne and in the co-location centers are hired through a public call. Mm -hmm. So it's an open um, selection. So basically, now we are missing the directors of the collocation centers. Not all of them, maybe, but some. For sure, the Italian one doesn't have a director mm -hmm. uh, yet. And uh, so their role is basically, uh, is quite similar to your idea of regional hubs, because they are expected to be both the multipliers of opportunities coming from uh, the other CLCs and the IT in general, uh, to local stakeholders, so so that in a way locally they can create or let's say enhance, let's say the the, the impact of what uh, is, has been developed elsewhere, and uh, of course they co-fund, so they they mm -hmm. put a lot of match funding on that. Uh, so regions basically hosting a CLC, a collocation center, means to put a lot of money and invest in a lot, <laughs> and this depends on of course regions that are willing to invest on cultural and creative uh, based developments. So that's the, more or less, this is what they do. So they will be basically uh, inform, train, distribute, or for example, support the participation to calls or bids or so with co-funding. This is the kind of things that co-location center, um, centers do in general, but this is, Totally, I mean, I, I was asked to present somehow the collocation center. Besides, Fondazione Fitzcarraldo is just one of the founding member. We are not running the collocation. Arteries, so which is innovation agency of uh, the region Emilia Romagna. So I couldn't say it anyway, but we were together three days ago and, and they are in, in, uh, in the process, in the making as well. So it's a little bit early, but from 2024 we will be, I mean, everything will be clear. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for this uh, snapshot. <laughs> so let's move to the other main topic that we address over the day. So the, um, the shift between the need to reflect on the economic impact of our initiative, of our project, but also the non-economic uh, value and the, the difficulty in assessing the economic value of the project supported by, by the SPAC framework. Uh, Veronica, to you, I would like to ask you to reflect with us about the fact that, yeah, we are assessing in the SAC price the project, looking several times on the social impact, but there are examples of economic impact and the regional uh, strategy that applied in links also proved that uh, a good ecosystem can create and can be uh, a very driver of economic uh, uh, growth. So can you give us your opinion and idea about how the links ecosystem grew up upon the start 
stay away from the usually safe stuff and have a good one. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Simona. Uh, technicality, maybe Alessandra may I ask you to pass me on the device. So thank you so much. Um, well, first, maybe let me start with uh, saying that, of course, uh, Stark runs now for more than a decade. And what we definitely know by now is that the Stark's prize projects uh, for sure influence, influence policy and not only policy on European level, but we also received uh, so many requests actually from so many other ministries all over the world to um, demonstrate also what uh, kind of uh, methodologies, collaborations, what kind of also uh, impact on, on various uh, technological levels are behind. We also saw that from the start's residencies in particular, there is um, a lot of learning and also impact generation really on this piloting area where they focus on very sector specific uh, impact uh, areas of, uh, for example, water ecologies was one uh, big one, also manufacturing. Um, we had um, calls focusing very much also on, on clean tech, for example. But after some years in starts, we, real, we realized also jointly as the community and also in the European Commission that we really need to bring um, these endeavors and these uh, collaborative ecosystems really down to, to, to regions. Uh, and um, that's why also this morning uh, focused so much really on the project of, of starts regional centers because it becomes automatically uh, a much more viable and a much more sustainable also action for the regional developments in, uh, in, in European uh, cities and European regions when the stakeholders within these regions really have a stake. Um, and uh, what we saw also uh, when creating this uh, first models of Starts Regional Centers is of course that um, the, the, the stakeholders uh, who are then able and capable and um, also part of the table to discuss and define what kind of challenges should be put together uh, and also what kind of challenges uh, should be uh, put or worked on together, um, there is much more chance to actually bring it either more to a market or at least to a sort of application state. Uh, um, and um, I think in Linz we are, of course, uh, in one of the uh, privileged areas where this kind of ecosystem is running already for uh, many, many years. Uh, we are, of course, uh, um, uh, one of these uh, cities which have not started only uh, yesterday, but we are working since uh, decades already on building this ecosystem of uh, universities, uh, univer academic players, uh, also applied universities, industry representatives, uh, very much also the city of Linz uh, is uh, involved in, in the endeavor. Then of course, uh, um, so many organizations also from the civil society, we have a whole, um, a whole center called the Baco Factory, which uh, actually hosts the creative industries uh, as well as uh, startup accelerators. And um, here we really see that there is a dynamic exchange between the petitioners in order to create uh, programs like this. And based on this, we also funded one of the starts uh, regional centers in, in Upper Austria, not only limited to Linz, but really to the region. Um, and uh, the most important system systemic partners are, of course, the Johannes Kepler University and, and us. But in our case, we actually uh, try to develop also really sector-specific alliances in, in one of the cases, and that's the project you see also here, Circular Records. Um, we um, invited uh, players um, from the field of plastic, um, in uh, our case, uh, the plastic industry, a company called Kreina, together with the uh, Johannes Kepler University uh, working on polymer research, uh, and um, also the city of Linz and their innovation main square, so it's basically an innovation office of the city, um, to work together with uh, artists really on bio-based uh, alternatives for uh, plastic uh, industry. Um, and those are really the examples which uh, became quite successful because all of the petitioners in the collaboration really had a stake and also um, a, a direct uh, a motivation and interest in it. Um, and 
and are also examples how one could then really bring this very much to audiences because it's always a matter also of, of how to to uh, mediate these topics and ultimately uh, back to the civil society. Um, and uh, with, with uh, one of this uh, um, uh, project, we of course then also um, started workshops and, and uh, invited uh, citizens really actively also in DIY approaches for these bio-based bio uh, plastic uh, alternatives. Um, in our Starts Regional Center, however, and of course we are um, running this through two uh, Starts funded projects, uh, one from Johannes Kepler University you heard about this morning, and also we are involved uh, in Starts in the City. Um, we are, however, not running um, the um, center only through uh, Starts funded projects. Uh, so we are very much also uh, trying to create uh, synergies uh, through other research uh, and cultural funding, both on, on regional, on city level, as well as on uh, national funding level, also through Creative Europe, uh, for example, and uh, in our case, even through uh, uh, private funding. Um, in, in one of the projects, for example, we are uh, working with a um, private company, uh, uh, also a research accelerator, um, <laughs> who um, involved artists and designers um, to discuss new types of use cases for circular economical models. We are working very much with uh, car manufacturers in the region and they brought them together to really discuss what can be reused uh, from the value chain, what can be re reduced also from the materials they're usually considering as waste and uh, invited artists and designers to really think of uh, possible models um, how um, um, that can be again a, a use case in the future. And those are um, just two examples, I think, which, which demonstrate really what the potential is really of bringing that also uh, uh, back to the region. Um, of course, there are, there are many, uh, and some of them are really directly on, on economic uh, levels. I mean, uh, those uh, for um, the circular economy platform were really directly uh, relevant for creating new kind of business models and also economical scales for, for the industry. But we also have seen, and that's what I really want to stress actually here, many projects which uh, create uh, value on regional levels in particular also in terms of um, comments of uh, how to actually serve uh, uh, for the public good, for the public uh, comments. And um, I have brought one here, which I really recommend looking into, um, Alexander Desi Ginsburg uh, with her Pollinator Pathmaker project. Who, um, I mean, I- Pollinator Path, sorry. We don't have time enough to look into the video, uh, but please be advised and recommended to really look into the project in much more detail. She actually created a tool uh, and a project uh, where you can design your own garden, which is based on the taste of pollinators instead of the taste of human beings. The purpose here is really uh, to maximi ma maximize uh, biodiversity, of course, um, and uh, you can uh, enter um, your, your garden settings and soil settings into uh, the web tool online and uh, get uh, out of uh, a basic recommendation, um, not only how to build the garden, but also how to maintain it. It is one of the really fantastic examples how to uh, generate really also um, impact uh, in this um, sense, really environmental uh, uh, impact for the broader uh, good um, and uh, definitely one of also um, our most favorite beloved projects. That's why it was also the prize winner of Starts Prize this year. Um, um, much a project which goes in a completely different uh, direction is uh, the uh, Amsterdam 3D uh, printed steel bridge. At that time when they started this project and it was really a vision of the designers and artists back there, it was not possible to print st uh, the steel at this scale at all. Uh, so they basically formed a collaboration. They brought everyone on the table who was necessary and needed uh, to, to operate the systems from the city of Amsterdam or the, the municipality players really 
to the steel companies and, and uh, research uh, organizations. And in 2021, they finally really installed this uh, steel uh, printed 3D bridge in the city center of Amsterdam. So it also shows on, on urban development levels how uh, artists can actually uh, make a change. And that was for sure also one of the projects which influenced quite drastically um, then uh, many policy uh, makers uh, all around uh, Europe. Um, one uh, project um, I still find uh, worth mentioning, and then I, I leave it uh, uh, there, is Remix El Barrio, uh, another project also in reference to Barcelona. <laughs> Um, it is, I think, one of the most interesting uh, ecosystem development projects uh, where uh, the Fiblad Barcelona really um, pulled together a whole group of uh, stakeholders from shop owners, from uh, designers, uh, people who basically want to uh, take part in a co-creation uh, process on how to um, produce uh, new types of products um, out of waste materials. And uh, what they did is uh, a whole uh, a process, a whole uh, co-creation process, of course, also involving, involving digital fabrication methodologies on how to produce, for example, bioplastics from orange peels or paper from coffee remains. They asked lo local shop owners, uh, uh, shop uh, owners with, um, for example, flower shops and, and garden products, but also, of course, restaurants and so on, what kind of uh, waste uh, they produce and what could be potentially made of out of this um, in, in one of the districts of Barcelona. So those are really the examples, I think, which demonstrate so well um, what um, impact you can generate also from, from regional collaboration, regal, regional uh, ecosystem, um, development, although, of course, the nasty groundwork is first building this community, um, which requires uh, partly years or decades of, of work, but it pays off uh, when you build the foundations. Thank you, Veronica. <laughs> I would have another question, but I prefer to go directly to Florian so we can open the Q&A. So, Florian, please. Help me to sum up a bit the discussion. <laughs> um, it's, it's challenging. We learned from the community what they are doing, what they are experiencing. We also learned some sneaks during the open session and from uh, the kick from the uh, European Commission and also from the Wallonia region, we learned how they are implementing things. Are we going in the same direction? There are some issues that still are still need to be cleared, what's your take? Uh, it's very much a matter of perspective and um, uh, from where you come and uh, what you envision and um, yeah, how then the way how that what you want to see is represented. No? I mean, it's basically a lesson in Renaissance uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, architecture or drawing. Um, uh, I mean, let me clarify. I mean, for an, um, uh, because I recently had this problem, encountered this problem, yeah, when I was introduced or announced as a professor for art theory and uh, documentary practices. Um, uh, uh, the uh, one one respondent <laughs> immediately assumed, yeah, this means that you have zero work experience in the cultural sector. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, so I have disclaimer here. Um, I worked 25 years uh, as a micro solo um, uh, whatever entrepreneur um, uh, in uh, uh, I think I counted recently eight of the 13 uh, sectors. Yeah, and this is very much informing uh, the way how I um, would like to talk or try to uh, summarize a little bit uh, because I um, I um, enjoyed very much the privilege of um, yeah, having been here, listened to the um, conversations and trying to connect this with uh, all the discussions that we had um, in various different contexts. So, I mean, running an art academy for seven years in the middle of a university of science and technology, you can imagine we share a lot of experiences um, in this context. Yeah, And we are running against um, uh, 
the same open doors, but also against the same walls. Yeah? And the question for me is how do we create, I mean, a kind of layer of abstraction, no? as the coders would say, um, or some kind of um, uh, uh, device for a much, much more efficient uh, exchange of experiences. Yeah? And I think uh, Alessandra pointed to this. This is what we really urgently need in the kick. So what you see behind me now um, is uh, a more or less spontaneous attempt to um, uh, yeah, um, turn this into a, 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 turn some of the key topics that we have been discussing into a diagram. And I think, I mean, it's, it only looks like the response to the knowledge triangle of the European Institute for Innovation and Technology. But I think um, we really have to um, uh, learn and relearn how do we um, put these terms, yeah, these three big key terms that came over and over again today, uh, impact value, uh, but also quality, which maybe was not so uh, often mentioned how we put them into different kind of relationships and this is the power that we have because in the context of the new European Bauhaus we put it in a in, in a different relationship than in the context of the kick than in the context of for example starts yeah so it's not that we're doing different things that we do, that we are, that we have different understandings of what impact or what value uh, or quality is it's just that we remix it and recombine it in slightly different ways yeah. um, we were running for the last four years a cost action in which we were i mean kind of um yeah discussing these questions over and over again running in many circles um and in this context i came up with um uh, yeah um, um a, a little bit um out of the ordinary um I wouldn't even call it definitions or approaches to these terms. Yeah? For example, um, I suggest to understand uh, impact uh, as an excess of value or as an excess of measurable value. Because, I mean, in the cultural and creative uh, sectors and industries, I mean, things have impact, not when they release 36 million uh, dollars at the box office and the film costed in production 35 million dollars. Yeah, this is not impact. Yeah, so even not even economical impact. It's economically uninteresting. They're interested in films that cost very little money and make a hell of money at the box office. Yeah, so it's always this excess, this unmeasurable, uncalculable, unforeseeable yeah, um, that creates the impact. And this is also um, um, uh, and this this it is connected to value. It is connected to measurement. Of yeah. While value we can understand as a kind of re reversal um, or an, an inversion of relationships that are otherwise instrumental. And we here we have to, I mean, I think it was discussed in the morning. Yeah? I mean, I don't think that there is any possibility in this technologically overdetermined world in which we live uh, to imagine um, uh, an outside of instrumentality. Of course, we are all constantly instrumentalized, yeah, and with algorithmic control and uh, surveillance technologies even more, yeah. We participate and we don't even know that we are participating. Um, so how can we brush these instrumental relationships? How can we read them against the grain, yeah? and also repoliticize them in a way that we can make this again to a topic or to a, a, a subject of discussion or even renegotiation. Here I think Barcelona is a fantastic example. Um, so this is how we produce value. Yeah? This is the value that, that, that the, uh, our sector is um, uh, connecting and then um, quality is a matter of um, not um, uh, economic sustainability, not um, uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, I think quality is a matter of aesthetic sustainability. Yeah. And um, this is a new dimension of sustainability. And I think the advent of AI or generative AI is teaching us a big lesson in terms of aesthetic sustainability. So this will, in my opinion, become a really, really important topic. And I mean, on that basis, through these relationships between these topics, uh, we can talk about concepts like affect, and here not only the power to create affect, 
which is normally associated with our sector, but also the power to be affected, as we learned from Baruch Spinoza. Um, so this is also a power. When I go to the cinema, um, when I enter a museum, uh, it is an eminently creative act to enjoy my power to be affected by uh, a creative product. And I think I would suggest to discuss participatory strategies um, uh, in, in this respect. Yeah. Um, and then we get out of this little bit strange forced participation. Um, thing. Um, advancement, for us, we founded this, or we started this cost action as the European Forum for Advanced Practices. Uh, together with my dear colleague Irit Drogov. Um, so we, this, the idea was to um, replace the idea of linear progression, yeah, um, uh, or also best practices, yeah, and introduce an, uh, the, the, the concept of advancement or, or advancing, yeah, because maybe this is better in order to um, keep all the complexities of the challenges and not reduce it to linear relationships. And then con confidence or creative confidence um, for me is the result of a con commitment to the yeah, ecosystem or the entirety um, of uh, participatory, anticipatory, and also emancipatory practices. Yeah. Um, I think it is, was very, very interesting to see against this backdrop uh, in the discussion um, that there is indeed, of course, obviously, a structural unbalance. Yeah? Um, uh, we are talking mostly about um, uh, the production of uh, artworks that are informed and enabled and facilitated by science and technology. But I think we really, and it was also mentioned, we really have to turn this around, and I know how difficult this is. Uh, we need open calls for scientists, as it was mentioned. We need residencies for engineers. Yeah? And when I talk to young generations of engineers, yeah, there is such a desperate need and desire to have access to this kind of privileged uh, knowledge that we are um, uh, uh, accumulating here in the cultural and creative sector. And the rigid university system with the, with the different faculties is not allowing this exchange, at least, I mean, it's punishing uh, on, uh, us for any form of exchange in this country, at least economically. So um, there is, we are in the middle of a kind of maturing process, I would say. Yeah? Um, uh, and uh, we have to constantly rethink and reflect and reinvent the role of technology. Because in, for me, in the moon, in the, in the discussion about the, um, uh, the moon disaster, no? yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the, 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 the deep uh, fake, yeah? it became really clear that maybe um, we, we don't even realize that we make a mistake yeah? and we confuse um, we talk about technology as if it were ideology, and we talk about ideology as if it were technology. Yeah? I mean, it's indeed somehow true. No? I mean, the, what is what right-wing populists are doing? That these are technologies of um, uh, disinformation. Um, but it's also not a matter of whether we believe in AI or not. Yeah? I mean, I, I mean, it, obviously, it's there. The question is, uh, for me, how does it? again, reorganize and, and uh, redevelop the relationship between um, documentary and fiction. And I studied at the film school, <laughs> so <laughs> this was already in the 80s, a big, big discussion, that every fiction film is, of course, much more documentary, and every documentary is much, much more fiction than we know it. And of course, we have not invented this. I mean, this is, this is characterizing ev every, um, uh, every, every medium, uh, at least when it's new. Uh, that there's a certain certain confusion. But I think it's really, really important that this technology is not a question of believing and uh, that, on the contrary, um, the, the challenge we are confronted with is um, technologies that are um, producing a, dis a suspension of disbelief. Yeah, this is, I mean, the <laughs> official definition of immersive technologies. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry to say. So, I'm really interested in uh, in a kind of re-alienation, um, in reintroducing doubt and questioning. And I think this was, in, in this sense, this was a really fan fantastic example. Uh, I would just say 
that the website is the artwork. Yeah? You need the making of the documentary when you see the, 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 the actor rehearsing it in the confrontation with the, with the piece. This, this for me is the, uh, this is where the artistic quality is. Yeah? And of course you need a product that you can uh, sell and so on and so forth. Yeah. So um, last but not least, I mean, I think uh, what is really, really important, and this is then indeed the red thread that runs through all these projects we are at the moment um, uh, uh, engaged with, from the kick to the new Bauhaus starts, um, you name it. Um, I think what we're experiencing is that the attempt to just translate or transfer conventional models of entrepreneurship and innovation one-to-one -one from the field of engineering and technology to the cultural and creative sectors, um, this is failing. Yeah? This cannot work. Artists are entrepreneurs at least at, since 500, uh, 500 years since the Renaissance. Yeah? You don't have to awaken an entrepreneurial mindset and so on and so forth. There is no job in the middle management of a state-run a uh, big industrial company waiting for us. Yeah? On the contrary, there is a massive precarization, 99% solo and micro entrepreneurs. We have to learn how do we turn the fragmentation of the sector from a weakness into a strength. And this is, this is our chance now. Yeah? Um, because of all the complexity, all the diversity and so on, it was discussed. Yeah? So we, the CCIs offer very, very timely opportunities uh, but we have to reinvent and recontextualize entrepreneurship and innovation uh, against the challenges of our of, of our times and or the challenges of the multiple crisis situations. And this has f means first of all, learning how to work together across disciplines, across geographical boundaries, um, and um, many many other um, kind of. Uh, identities that prevent us uh, from, uh, from collaborate, co collaborating. Yeah. So this, I think, is, is, is the challenge that, uh, that is at stake. Yeah. And I think we should have much, much more confidence. Um, uh, often I hear or I sense yeah, that when people hear social innovation, and wh from what I understand, this will be a big topic in the next work program. Yeah. Uh, when, people, when, when our colleagues hear social innovation, they immediately think, oh, this is charity. Yeah. No, <laughs> you can make a hell of money in this sex in, in social innovation. Yeah, on at the same time, um, uh, I mean, I just got just a few minutes ago. I got the message: um, uh, the Spanish government is investing. Uh, just uh, just announced that they will invest four hundred million euros into an impact investment fund, social impact investment fund. We are talking with. Uh, philanthropists, uh, social impact investors, and so on and so forth. Money is not the problem in this context. We need to build the frameworks and the, um, uh, the, 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 the also the evaluation and risk mitigation um, tools yeah, in order um, uh, to offer possibilities to invest this money in a responsible and accountable way uh, for the right purposes. Okay, so I think I will stop here. Thank you. very good sum up of the day and I really want to ask you uh, if you have questions in the audience for all the speakers here yes we have one uh, I have a question for Florian but it's uh, extended for everybody uh, how do you see um, the problem of um, the extension of uh, human uh, ingenuity through tools that are in the control only of the biggest concentration of capital, and that is uh, artificial intelligence, because that will present a very difficult landscape for uh, uh, tangential uh, viewpoints and, and uh, <coughs> ideologies, as you say, <laughs> for example. Uh, to to thrive because there's a very uh, big gap if you don't have the access to this enabled technology that is pro proven that can raise productivity or uh, uh, performance by 40% in some people and uh, if it's uh, it, there's no possibility of uh, 
um, creating a, an antithesis to this because it's like one company holding the whole thing. Now, I think there are two scenarios, no? I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert in, on AI, and of course, I mean, this would be a whole other conference. <laughs> no? um, we just made a workshop in Brussels in the context of Cyanotypes, um, our Blueprint Skills uh, project, where we, where we discussed exactly these questions. And uh, one of the colleagues who, I mean, is really um, <laughs> working on this topic, is that there, they, there are two options, yeah? I mean, on one hand, we, what, what you're referring to is now, I mean, this is surprise effect of, uh, uh, of AI or a, a popularization or radical democratization of a very, very complex technology that is um, uh, easily accessible and uh, general purpose. Yeah, <laughs> you can type in there whatever, yeah, I mean, and then if you have the help of a prompt engineer, <laughs> even better. So, but um, more realistically, the, the, the future of uh, these I mean, beyond the hype, yeah, the future of uh, generative AI will be much, much more tactical, will be much, much more specific, yeah, and then you can introduce open source um, uh, uh, approaches, which I think in this context will be probably more urgent than ever. Um, uh, but of course, it, w it does not work if there is one AI that is dominating everything. I mean, a unicorn AI also, yeah. Uh, then of course this can this cannot be open source in the same way as Google never could publish their algorithm, although they wanted so much, yeah. um, because then all the search engine optimization uh, would uh, trick it. Yeah, so we we have a similar discussion today about op I mean objections against open source that are pragmatic and uh, somehow I mean reasonable. Yeah, but uh, in the moment when it's much much more specific, um, tactical and uh, limited, yeah, then the effect and the, the performance of the, AI, of the AI is of course uh, more interesting and better and uh, then it's also no problem to uh, make it open source. I also think that there should be a percentage, yeah, like in the 1980s with the Xerox, yeah, there should be a percentage of every um, euro or dollar that an AI company makes with AI, there should be a certain percentage, like one cent, yeah, or one promille or whatever, that goes directly uh, to support um, uh, the creation of new works in, the, in, the, in art and culture. Because it is trained with past creativity, yeah, it's, um, in my eyes, it's also the bankruptcy of the IPR model as we know it, or uh, the, 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 the generic application of one understanding of IPR across all <laughs> faculties and disciplines. Yeah. So there are many, many interesting aspects that um, some of them are a little bit more optimistic. <laughs> um, uh, some are, um, uh, of course, I mean, um, very frightening. Yeah. But it's a matter of uh, property. Who owns the means of production um, in a very, very old-fashioned way? Okay, we have another question here. Thank you, everybody, for the different insights in the programs. But I also have a question for you, Florian. The device that you sketched, I find it fantastic. <laughs> it really gives the art world a completely different view to relate uh, to, to the questions we have. Um, we have written with Bozar a project, Studiotopia, for Creative Europe, which was this reversal model, bringing scientists to the studio of renowned artists uh, it's, we're going to continue it in 2024. But I had a question, maybe it's too abstract. We were looking for some sort of philosophical basis in which we ground that sort of new thinking. In your development of this device and the work that you do, can you mention some philosophers that are crucial in our thinking today? <laughs> no, I mean, I, to be all, full disclosure, no, I mean, uh, we invited for this workshop um, uh, um, uh, in Brussels that I mentioned. I mean, for example, Michael Hart, who translated uh, Spinoza to English. Yeah, so I mean, he gave us a really good introduction into the concept of the power <laughs> to be affected. Yeah, uh, but this is also queer theory. Yeah, 
um, contemporary queer theory, very, very interesting. But um, uh, you can also go back into Brecht and um, uh, the theory of the epic theater and uh, or Peter Weiss with his aesthetics of resistance. I mean, I think there's myriads of references you, uh, yes, I have not invented it, but I mean, it's kind of a reorganization and I just changed it this morning um, uh, after your, after the first round of presentations because I said, okay, there's um, always a new version. So it's not published, <laughs> um, but I hope there will be soon a possibility. So thank you very much for the feedback. It's very encouraging. So thank you very much. Thank you all for, uh, for being a very uh, attentive all day long. Uh, from my perspective, it has been a very interesting and insightful discussion. We learned that there are parallel uh, strategies going on. The community is ready to, to provide input to the European Commission and to the other policy makers. Um, we just, I just noticed that we mentioned Barcelona a lot of times. I mean, and, and then Linz, but Barcelona, it's <laughs> always our um, point of reference when we talk about a local ecosystem which works with the community, et cetera, and all the other elements that we, we discussed. So the point for me and the open discussion for the next uh, meeting that we hopefully will have soon, it's about how to engage the local policymakers in that. Because it's clear that we have the capabilities, we have researchers, we, we know how to bring also the citizens, which is the other part of the story. But I think that still a lot of discussion uh, needs to be done on how to have on board the policymakers at the local level. And I think that maybe the local location center in this case, once they will be in place, could have a role also in providing some example on how to structure in, uh, this at local level. What do you mean, what do you mean could be a role? So if you know about some policymaker, local or regional, who could be interested because is somehow he or she is willing to how design something, some willing that has not, or up to now, uh, so far they, they didn't find a solution or so, but they could. Uh, I think that joining, for example, the IT uh, regional in C reform will be quite interesting. They're going to meet, we met the first time uh, last June in Berlin and now actual, actually the first uh, uh, meeting with the first 30 uh, who applied is meeting next week in Bilbao. Mm -hmm. But they are open for others because of course this is really relevant. So if you know, probably among you there are no policy makers but you live in a city or in a region or, or with a council or whatever, who could be interested because that's the point. So how to create the right environment and the enabling conditions so that these things can happen. Yeah. That's the question and that's the way, I mean, and, and the, the option is also, of course, there's politics, okay? Yeah. So we all know, but there are also policies and, and that is where we can somehow have a say yeah. and, and support each other. Yeah. Thank you very much also on all the people online. <laughs> Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, Peter, for being there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.